on this prequel episode, we've got our Ender's Game fan poll follow-up. We're learning about P.D. James and previewing Children of Men. Hello and welcome back to this film is like the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. We have so much listener feedback to get to, which we thought we would. Boy, do we. So we're going to get right to our patron shout outs. We don't have any new patrons this week, but we do have our Academy Award winners, and they are Paul, Kat Insminger, Ben Wilcox, Jeff Niederhofer, Teresa Schwartz, Ian says invaginate, but also obliate too. If you want to cry about bugs dying without Orson Scott Card's problematic elements, check out Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Winchester's Forever, Grey Hightower, Eli Young's, Gratch... Just Scratch, Shelby Says Monsters and Mayhem is out now, That Darn Skag, V Frank, Ran Out of Snark This Week, So I'm Just Nathan, I Enjoy Long Walks in Forest Park, or I Did in College at Wash U, and Alina Starkov. Thank you all very much for supporting us at the Academy Award winning level, and uh, we appreciate you all. Let's find out what everybody had to say about Ender's Game. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Lots. Lots. <laughs> Our most feedback ever, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's up there. Um. Okay, so on Patreon, we had 12 votes for the book and zero for the movie. Mm-hmm. That will be a theme. <laughs> Ian says invaginate, but also... <laughs> Oubliette two. Mm-hmm. You pronounced that differently than I Obli- did. I said obliate. So there's a. I think I was thinking of a different. There's a word like obliate or something, and that I thinking. I don't know, but I don't. I don't know what oubliate or whatever oubliette that is. Is a place where you put people when you want to forget about them. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a kind of dungeon. Interesting. I believe. I know what this is in reference to. I'm not going to get It's very convoluted, but it's not in reference to our podcast. Yeah. So um, he actually messaged on Patreon and said that we could say his old name. Um, <laughs> no, that's but fine. we're not cowards. That's fine. Uh, so Ian said there's it is related to philosophers in space. Just really quick. That's yeah. the lo- that's the short version of the long story. Anyways. Continue. Uh, so Ian said there's just so much more depth to the book. The Peter and Valentine stuff is significantly larger chunk in the battle school. The book allowed us a much better insight into who Ender was and why exactly he was such a good commander. His character arc in the denouement was, as Katie put in the main episode, earned. The book takes the time to set up a lot of the more of the emotional manipulation of the children and Graf's contention that he's willing to be the monster if that's what it takes to protect humanity. He comes off much more Machiavellian in the book, where in the movie, he's just kind of a dick. I never knew this was written after Speaker for the Dead and as a prequel. It makes a ton of sense as this book is wildly out of character with the rest of the series. I don't know if I would recommend reading the rest of the Ender series to people, but I did find it much more philosoph- much more philosophical exploration of life, death, and legacy, and fewer slow-mo dual laser pistol spins. There you go. Uh, pretty much on par with what we said. I just to clarify, I don't know for sure. We talked about the speaker for the dead thing. We're not. I'm not. We're not like positive that he wrote the entire book of Speaker for the Dead. Yeah. I, well, prior I think to if this. memory serves me right, I think Speaker for the Dead was like the book that he wanted to write. Yes. And so, then he started writing right. Ender's Game as like a character exercise, yes. and, and it that turned became into... the first book. And so, to me, it seems more likely that maybe he had, like, a, an outline slash yeah, idea something. for Speaker for the Dead and then wrote Ender's Game, yeah, like we said, yeah. as a prequel. But I, I don't know if he actually wrote the entire book. Is yeah, my I point. don't know. Anyways, yeah. But, yeah, overall, I very much obviously agree based on being <laughs> echoing a lot of my thoughts in the episode. Vinny the Fungus said, Great name. Okay, so I'm choosing the book because it's just better than the bad movie. I have actually been thinking about how they could have made a good movie. The main idea in my head is it would have to be more than one movie, probably. I would also treat it like Lord of the Rings or Ready Player One. There would be a massive retooling of the plot where the summary is the same, but it just flows better and maybe combine a few characters or flesh out some more. 
Yeah, I uh, I mean, more than one movie or a TV show, I think, is the way to go, probably would mm-hmm. make the most sense. I also still think it, a one movie would be feasible. I think even the version they did here, if they had just, and maybe they filmed more of it, if this movie was, like I've said in the in the uh, like the intro to the main episode, if this movie was 45 minutes longer, I don't even know if you necessarily need an entire other movie to make this work. Because I think it's close as is. I just think they needed to spend, as I mentioned, more time sort of uh, addressing how awful, like really capturing thematically what the book is trying to do, as opposed to just narratively what the book is trying to do, Mm -hmm. which the movie focuses way more on the narrative than like the details of what's going on and, and how it feels and what it means, basically. Colin Osborne said... Overall, the book has so much more depth that the movie just lacks. Characterization of Ender, characterization of Peter and Valentine, details on the manipulations they are putting Ender through. I do agree he is a very Mary Sue character, and I think his portrayal as a tactical genius suffers pretty greatly from the fact that Orson Scott Card himself isn't particularly gifted in that area himself, so Ender's amazing revelations come off as, well, duh. I wonder if I misread it or if I am misremembering, but I definitely got the impression that in the book, the only one who didn't know the war was real was Ender. All the other kids knew it was real and just weren't telling Ender, or Ender was isolated from them. Maybe it was something that is explored more in Ender's shadow as well. Those two books flow together in my mind. I don't know for sure. I did not get the feeling that the other kids knew, but I also don't have a like i i couldn't i would gun to my head i wouldn't guarantee that that wasn't the mm-hmm. case i just don't recall it. well and you didn't read ender shadow no, too and that no. seems like something that might be explored right more if that is the case because my and i think part of it is in the book we don't really get much of the reaction of the other kids at the end it mm-hmm. just really quickly focuses in on ender and his reaction and we don't really know and and then he doesn't really, and so I, it may be mentioned but i don't recall I clearly didn't think that the other kids knew, but yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, it's possible, but I, if I had to put money down, I would say the other kids didn't know, but I could see being wrong about that. I, I'd be like, I'd put a small bet down <laughs> <laughs> that that's the case. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I tend to agree that some of the, the strategy in the battles that is the reason that his Ender is so gifted come across a little like, well, obviously people would have come up with this. <laughs> this 11 year or the six year old is not that much smarter. Oh, I should use cover. I should use my legs to block bullets. Um, incredible. I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree. That darn skag said voted for the book. The movie, which I watched before I read the book back in the day, left me a little lost. After I read the book, I was pretty surprised at the movie's decision to truncate the book's multi-year time span. There's a lot of character stuff squeezed down into the span of about one year. Yep. And it's just hard to make that work. Mm -hmm. Gratch, just Gratch, said, I voted for the book. I've always found it sad and moving how Ender gets utterly destroyed by the training and the movie just makes Asa Butter Asa look mildly uncomfortable. Yeah, I I would agree with that. V. Frank said, book for the win. I had always thought of this one as one of the unfilmable novels. How would you ever find a way to convincingly portray six-year-olds committing manslaughter and genocide? along with all of the special effects, heavy battle room, and space sequences. And let's not even get started on the Ender's siblings take over the world plotline, which would basically consist of two people typing a lot. The fact that they even made a marginally successful translation of the material into a movie is impressive. I I would at least kind of agree that, I, I like I said in the episode, I don't think this movie was as bad as I was expecting, especially not as bad of a, an adaptation as I was expecting. Mm-hmm. But it's not a particularly good movie if you've not read the book. Yeah, and then I it also is, does enough stuff that, that book readers find annoying, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's definitely one of those adaptations that doesn't really work if you haven't read the yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, but then also makes enough changes and stuff that book readers are like, I hate, like, why would you change? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you almost can't win there. <laughs> like, like. In that regard, it's almost the worst version of an adaptation. 
And our last comment on Patreon was from Ran Out of Snark this week, so I'm just Nathan. I enjoy long walks in Forest Park, or I did in college at WashU. Okay, humble brag. <laughs> went to Wash U. Just, just casually dropping that I went to Wash U in there. We see you. <laughs> and Nathan said, hey, I liked it again this week. Brian, you did a great job with your descriptions of the story from the book. There's no need to run yourself down. Was I running myself down? I don't remember. I don't know. I sometimes like, you know. I, I, you, I, you hedge a little bit. I hedge sometimes. a little bit and I anticipate people's. Because that's the thing that I'm going to annoy me in, in, in podcasts sometimes is when I'm like, if people don't realize what or like, I don't know. I, I, I try to, I, I kind of anticipate, my brain just works that way. I anticipate mm-hmm. responses to things I'm saying. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I get what you're saying. I don't think I was running myself down. I'm just trying to <laughs> cover my bases and express all, you know, sides of the argument. So on Facebook... We had eight votes for the book and zero for the movie. Bridget said, book for me. As I said in the episode thread, the movie just didn't hit enough of the character development, which is what a large part of the book is about. But I will absolutely give the movie a consolation prize of depicting or improving what the author talked about with those amazing visuals. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, Steven said, have to go with the book simply because his inner monologue helped us see more of what was happening to him. I felt at the end he was barely holding on. His final attack on the planet was a big F you to the people who used and broke him, and it just didn't come through in the movie. I think it should have been a mini series so they would have enough time to explore his experience. I will say this feedback is really validating my... <laughs> opinion of the film because there are a lot of echoing of my sentiment yeah which makes me feel like i did a good job which i appreciate because it was my first time reading the book you know i don't really have a connection or like history with the book so i'm Mm -hmm. assuming some of these people at least you know yeah yeah read it in their childhood and have stronger feelings about it so it's nice to know that we were on the same page sarah said i chose the book This was a book that I had to read my freshman year of high school, and I remember genuinely enjoying it. I'm not much of a reader. I loved the part about the mind game, giant game thing, something that the movie didn't touch on nearly as much as it seemed a part of the book. I watched the movie a couple years after it was released, and honestly, all I can remember is that it had a weird ending that I wasn't satisfied with. I'm glad I'm not the only one to think so. Yep. Not wrong at all. Absolutely weird ending. Andy said, considering the writer and subject matter, it's a weird choice to have to make. It came out when I was 13, by which time I was already into fantasy and sci-fi enough to discern between writers like Moorcock and Le Guin and your John Normans and Cards. But the book is better at being a book than the film is at being a film, I would say. The conscious movement away from reactionary writing in the genre began with the new wave of sci-fi in the late 50s and the 60s, and the lines were firmly drawn by the time Card wrote Ender's Game. This person knows more about the history yeah, of sci-fi than more, I, so I'll take your they, word yeah. for it. <laughs> I don't know that But also about burn on John Norman. I don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> I know Le Guin, or Le Guin, and uh, is it Le Guin? Le Guin. I think it's Le Guin, I um, think. And she's uh, don't come for me if it's I not. Know, I know. Uh, I actually just ordered one of her books recently. But I think the um, the line in here that I really like is the the book is better at being a book than yes. the film is at being a film because sometimes it really does come down to that. Yeah, absolutely, it it does, and I I that that was a line that I very much agree with. Where it's yeah, like we said, the movie just doesn't work as a standalone movie. Yeah. Works more as a tie-in, but also doesn't work as a tie-in, where the book just kind of works. And our last comment on Facebook was from Adam, who said, My vote has to go to the book just for how much I loved it as a kid. I read it when I was seven or eight, and little autistic me with my little autistic hyper-empathy identified hard with Enders feels like an adult on the inside, but gets infantilized by actual adults characterization. The adult's treatment of Ender taught me to always question authority, to never take rules and norms for granted as immutable, and to never assume people in charge have my best interests in mind. 
The way the genocide of the bugs was all over lack of communication and othering taught me to empathize with everything and never and to never immediately think of anything living, including non-human animals, as intrinsically inferior. Ender's response to the bullies taught me that if I saw people treating others unjustly, the right thing to do was to stand up to them in a way that would make them think twice before oppressing or harming others in the future. Kind of like when my response Kind of like my response when y'all covered Starship Troopers, this book was a big part in seven-year-old me becoming current 34-year-old non-binary vegan um, anarcho-socialist. anarcho-socialist fascist punching me, and I hope it would have made Card <laughs> physically ill to know he I did was that. I was just going to say that, I, and uh, <laughs> the fact that that is you now, I'm sure Card loves it. <laughs> That being said, in the rare cases I still recommend this book to people, I do always tell them to pirate it or get it from a library, then donate what they would have spent on it to the Trevor Project or something equivalent. Lastly, the bone nose thing is a myth. Oh no. The cartilage can't get pushed into your brain like that. Head trauma is no joke, though, and you could absolutely deliver a fatal headbutt under the right circumstances. I also want to give two big pedipalps up <laughs> in support of reading Children of Time. Fantastic. A very uh, interesting comment. Thank you, Adam, for typing that all up. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I uh, continued spreading a myth about... Uh, or uh, bone, yeah, bone I was guilty and yeah, uh, <laughs> perpetuating a myth about the the nose. That's a thing I heard years ago. It's a, one of the problems when you have a brain like mine, where I, my brain very naturally, I like trivial mm-hmm. knowledge stuff. My brain just holds on to forever. It's one of the, yeah. the things my brain does really well. And so when I f- hear things like that, they just get stored away. I do. I, I am a very skeptical person. I, I try to make sure anytime I find out information like, you know, this is something I probably heard when I was like 13 or whatever. Yeah. But anytime I do find, you know, come or hear new information and stuff, I'm always very apt or quick to, you know, do my research and make sure it's a legit thing. This was just something bouncing around in my head as being true. And then it was uh, reconfirmed because the book, I think, specifically says that is what happened Mm -hmm. um so yeah it is nice to know that that is not actually true but it is that like he said head trauma is no joke and so regardless of whether or not the (laughs) bone cartilage or whatever going into your brain yeah you could absolutely kill somebody by headbutting them hard enough so or or punching them or whatever in the head (laughs) don't get hit in the head it's bad (laughs) and yeah uh, the rest of that was fantastic i do um it is, it is, I do always love seeing, because we, you know, we talked to the, about this a little bit, or at least in re- maybe after the fact and somewhere here or there about like Harry Potter and stuff about yeah. the fact that just because, you know, the author of something intended, even, you know, and, and it's, it's like, it's very difficult too, because like, I think, you know, cards and tensions in this book are not necessarily indicative of his more recent or maybe not even more recent, but his like political stances mm-hmm. in life it, it, it to me at least it's this book's a, a kind of an interesting mixture and mixture of messages um, but very much the messages that adam got from this book are a lot of the same ones that i got and talked about in the episode and so i do think it's always good to keep in mind that even though you know an author of something may be shit or some of the views in something can be interpreted as as terrible you can still just because you like that doesn't mean that you're bad for liking it or that you're not getting good things out of it, mm-hmm. I guess. And so I, I I don't know. I just thought that was a, a really nice comment and uh, really enjoyed it. So on Twitter, we had 18 votes for the book, zero for the movie, and one listener who couldn't decide, thus ruining our perfect landslide. <laughs> How dare you? Whoever you were. Couldn't decide, listener. <laughs> Uh, Kelly Napier said, when trying to choose between two turd burgers, how does one choose which turd burger is less turdy? I chose the book because the movie should have been better based on the casting. The book is a turd burger. The movie is a turd burger. But the book is slightly less turdy. Okay. Well, I would disagree that the book is a turd burger. <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with that. I, I mean, obviously, just your opinion. But uh, I thought the book was pretty, pretty good. Um, and enjoyable and I definitely would have seen it being much more enjoyable which I, I enjoyed it quite a bit now but I would have enjoyed it even a lot more as a, uh, when, I, when I was younger mm-hmm. but I will agree absolutely with the fact that the movie should have been better based on the casting 
This is phenomenal. Talk, it's cast. a phenomenal cast. Asa Butterfield's great. Um, we didn't mention it at all in the episode, but uh, big fans of uh, Sex Education, yeah. where he's like the main character. Fantastic show, and he's great in that. Uh, Haley Steinfeld's great. Yeah. Um, and I don't think any of them are bad in the movie. Although, to be fair, he is. Um, he is a a bad adaptation alum on this show, because he was also in uh, Miss Peregrine's. Oh, that's right. He was, wasn't yeah. he? God, he was in. He's been in a ton of it. He's in Hugo too, which we haven't oh, done. We Hugo. haven't done that. Hugo's a good movie. From my memory, I only saw it once, and I didn't. I didn't realize it was an adaptation at the time. Um, I think it's like a kids' book or picture. I don't know. Which, I, although now, to be fair, I don't recall his performance being something that didn't make. Yeah, in Miss in, Peregrine's, in Peregrine's. Yeah, was just, his performance. That was men. just not yeah. a good adaptation. Um, and uh, Viola Davis, Ben Kingsley. Harrison Ford, all, all kinds of people. And I will say, though, I don't think any of them were bad. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I didn't think that, like, they gave poor performances. There's a few lines that at the end, Harrison Ford, I know people don't love his, and I think maybe we'll have a comment about it. I know it's not everybody likes his performance in this. I don't think it's great. I think it's terrible in the trailer. I, like, <laughs> when I watched that trailer to put it in the prequel episode, I, like, couldn't get over how awful of a trailer it was. Yeah. Like, his board... 20 years ago, the you, you know, the the formics attacked or like he just sounds like he's like it's so monet it's so weird and it's just I, I thought the trailer was terrible, but in the movie I thought he was okay. Um and so I thought the performances were pretty pretty good overall. Again, Asa Butterfield yeah. has some bad lines here and there, but that's direction and editing as much as anything else and writing. But anyways, so but yeah, I, I it could have been better than it was. Yeah. A Harrison Ford is an actor that I always feel like I can tell when he knows that the thing he's making is not particularly good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that. And it's also a mixture of how much he, I don't know if it's how yeah. much he cares. Like or how much he wants to be there. Or how much the, yeah, how much he wants to be there versus how much the the character like just like vibes with the natural Harrison Fordness. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean? Because it's, it is always interesting when sometimes he's like, you know, because there's plenty of movies where he's just he's like sleepwalking through the role, like more recent movies for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but I didn't feel he was like with this role. I didn't feel like he was as sort of sleepwalking through this role as he was in something like uh, Indiana Jones for like Crystal Skull or some of the other mm -hmm. like bad roles he's had in recent years. I thought he was OK, maybe not as good as he could have been. But I also just think he was miscast, as I mentioned in the episode. So. Uh, Matt Nelson, Guy What Draws Stuff, said, Overall, I thought the film was a pretty solid adaptation, but I definitely think the book is better. I read this book over and over when I was younger and have always liked it. Yep. Yep. April Abmansky said, I liked the book well enough. It's a decent, pulpy sci-fi novel. The movie was just so dull and forgettable. It really, yeah, yeah. It really I think is. Yeah, dull and forgettable. Is I've already forgotten a lot about it. Yes, me too. <laughs> Absolutely. Patrick Wood said, "I never got around to reading this one, but I guess I had two hours to watch a sleepy Harrison Ford look like he would rather be anywhere else besides the set of this movie." There, there's our comment yes. about it. And I, I, so I <laughs> will say, I agree. Sometimes he comes across that way, and like I said, it, in the trailer, it's wowza. Mm. But there was other times where I felt like he was he was actually there for it. Like he was he was committing and doing it. But I see your point. Maybe I should rethink how I spend my time. Overall, I had two main issues with this film. Firstly, I didn't feel like the movie gave a good enough explanation of why they were using children as military commanders. Maybe this was just a me problem, but I couldn't buy into the premise. Secondly, Ender just felt like an unlikable and violent little shit from the outset and stays that way for a majority of the running time. Then at the very end, his turn into feeling empathy for the aliens feels very abrupt and doesn't land. This movie is just a big mess. I think Arrested Development made the point this movie was attempting much more effectively, but did it in a three-minute comedy scene. The only enjoyable part of this experience was reading a letterboxed review that simply said Starship Poopers. Okay, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good <laughs> that's a pretty good review. Um uh so just to clarify on both of the like the two points, your two main issues with the film. Um, I agree that one, they don't do a good enough job explaining why they're using yeah. children. No. And I, I mean the real reason is that so they can indoctrinate them into this from a young age. 
uh, to their 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 reflexes and it, kind of in the same reason that all like v- professional video game players are under the age of 25 or you know yeah. they're cuz your 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 brain is like optimally functioning for the type of thing they're doing here when you're you know fairly young um maybe not 11 years old but you know in that again under 30 age range um so that's part of it also they keep them so they can keep them naive to the what's actually going on mm-hmm. because they're young and 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 naive and they break them in the way they do they can then use them specifically in Ender's case by not telling him that he's actually fighting the people, as we talked about in the main episode, it allows him to to make decisions that if he knew the the actual outcome of what his decisions were, that he might not make those decisions. Yeah. So they're doing that as well. And maybe that wouldn't be as easy to fool if the person was, you know, a, a 40 year old who had been around the block a few times and whatnot. Um, so all of those play in the movie. I agree. Doesn't really do a good job handling all that or explaining the reason for all of that. Uh, and there's probably other reasons on top of that. Second point, uh, the violent Ender being a violent little shit. The The book also has this problem to some extent. It's one of the reasons I had a bunch of red flags in it is that it, <laughs> it, it does sort of feel, and you bounce back and forth, but it does often feel in the book that you're, that Orson Scott Card is, is, is writing a character that he identifies with and then, because of his like sort of violent tendencies, but then finding ways to like forgive them without Ender ever mm-hmm. like making a change or, or changing it all yeah. really because also he's like very empathetic and, and sympathetic. So like, again, it, you kind of get your cake and eat it too with Ender the way card writes him in the book. And I think part of the problem in the movie is that, it's already an issue in the book, but then it's amplified in the movie because you don't get a, enough of Ender's thoughts and thought process and what he's going through. And you also don't see the way he does. He's not tortured and manipulated as much in the movie as he is in the book, which kind of helps explain and shape him into what he. So there's lots of reasons that the movie just doesn't do what the book or doesn't um, do a good job sort of developing Ender's character in the way the book does, but it's already a bit of a problem in the book. So yeah. they were starting from a place of, of a of problem and then didn't make it any better. Made it worse, in fact. And our last comment on Twitter was from Books to Watch, um, who said, Great episode, guys. Very thorough. Having read this and it feels like a little bit of a dead. backhanded compliment. <laughs> Very thorough. All right. It's a three hour episode. We get it. I take too many notes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I I am the champion of keeping our episodes under two hours. I am as well. I like to do that. But also, I have opinions. Anyways. Uh, Having read this and Speaker for the Dead, I started Ender Shadow. Bought a used book, of course. Movie wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Author is way worse than I thought he'd be. Prefer the book. Also, it's not great that buggers is a British pejorative term. Yes, which I don't know so, if we mentioned that. I don't at think all. we talked about but it. Yes, that you is, mostly called them formics. I mostly called them formics. Partially, that was the reason. It kind of because um, uh, I was aware of that. But um, yeah, in in British slang, buggers is like a, a slang term for like gay people, mm. or used to be. I don't know if it's even really used. I, it may still As be. I, I, I think I've heard it used like um, kind of like f off. Y- yes, like, but I've I think heard a, it used like that. It has. But... It, yeah, I think it's used that way, but I think it. I don't know if it originated in terms of like basically, yeah. It, it, it like it's it's like a slang term for like sodomy, hmm. kind of like buggering is like sodomy. But like oh a sl- yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah. Mean? I know what you're talking about. And now. so I think yeah. like buggers would be like people who engage in sodomy I mean, would be the idea. I, I, I think. I know Orson Scott Card is American, but yes. am I surprised no. that he There's would no use way he that in that context? That. Yeah, no. Because especially at the time he wrote this book, I think that was a slang that would have been used a lot more. Like mm-hmm. I don't know. Again, I don't know how much that slang is really used anymore, especially especially in <laughs> in polite society by people who aren't assholes. But yeah. Um, but even still, I don't know how much it's used. Whereas it's used. I think it was used quite a bit back in his, mm-hmm. you know, when he was writing the book. So, All right. So on Instagram, we had seven votes for the book and zero for the movie. Now, if you go back and look at the poll, 
where I save them in our story highlights, it's going to look like the movie got a vote. It didn't because yes. that person messaged they us specifically immediately. Messaged. I saw that, yeah. I was like, well, I'm sorry. Like, I hit movie on accident. I didn't mean to. Yeah. Um, so that's what this film inspires in people. Uh, Wilson Noble 4727 said, book goes into detail in places the film doesn't. Boom, short and sweet. Very succinct review. Yep. Have to agree, didn't yep. even read the book. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's true of almost every adaptation, true. to be fair. Yeah. But yes. Thug of Smeg? <laughs> what a name. <laughs> said, was a great movie. Not as good as the books, but I wish they made a sequel. Interesting. So, a somebody, great movie. Somebody, who but it's not, not as not good as the good book. The books. So the book they must think is a masterpiece. But they should have made a sequel. Interesting. I don't think this made enough money to get a sequel. Oh no! I think we <laughs> mentioned that it did not. It bombed. It did not make its. It made like a, a basically made its money back, which is losing money wah, at the end wah. of the day. Yeah. And the leap seventy seven said, "Well, here we go." I never got into Orson Scott Card, which you called him Picard at least three times. As, the great thing is that as soon as I, I noticed that I did it that one time, I was like, oh, shit, I bet I've done it several times. But as soon as I realized I did it that time, I was like, I bet I've done this <laughs> or will do it again. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I heard you do it the time before you realized, yeah. but I wasn't sure if I had heard what you said correctly <laughs> yeah. and you had already moved on, so yep. I was like, I'll Fair just enough. let it go. Yep. But then you did it again. Yep. Uh, anyway, um, and after looking through his catalog, I can see why. So much cringe. Add cards, problematic stances, and it makes you wonder what is rattling in his brain. Ender's Game seems to be a massive outlier in his bibliography, and it is a legitimately intriguing book. Like Heinlein's Starship Troopers, it seems to push an ideology to avoid another and in the process create some bad takes. If the movie wasn't so condensed and poorly made, I would have chosen the movie just because it would have ultimately pissed Card off. But yeah, the movie is brutal and really the only decent parts are when Harrison Ford goes full fascist at the end in all his finger pointing glory. I will say the Formic Queen was quite cool. Plus, I agree with Katie's take on Ender's final battle solution. It definitely has a Zap Brainigan versus the Killbots kind of vibe to it. Yeah. It's just so obvious. It is. Yeah, it's a little, it's a like, little obvious. If, I, if, if that's something that I could have come up with, then there are two options. Either I'm secretly a tactical military genius, or it's not that unique of an idea. Who that would, would be know? Wild. <laughs> who would know? I was not forced into military school at six years old, so who would know? Who would know? Maybe true. I just wasted my my tactical genius. There you go. Maybe you did. Katie, how did this final vote tally break down? <laughs> um, break making history. On this, this is it's list. not our first landslide. Um, Stir of Echoes was also a landslide for. Uh, I think for the movie. When you say landslide, do you mean that I the mean book it was, got zero votes? Yes, it got oh, zero votes. Oh, okay. Yes. Never mind then. When I, thought I say this landslide, was... that's what I mean. Okay. But this is our first one with a significant number of votes. Oh, yeah, true. That episode didn't have a ton of votes because yeah. it was a lesser known yeah. movie end book. Yeah. Um, but our winner was the book with 45 votes to the movie zero. Wowzer. Um, plus that one listener who couldn't decide. Couldn't decide. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Wild. But yeah, I, I mean, I was expecting it to run away with it. Honestly, I mean, I'm a little surprised we don't get more of these. On, uh, well, yeah. depending on, I guess it depends on what we do. But uh, I was expecting something along these lines. But I thought you almost always have like at least one or two votes for like a, some kind of uh, yeah. out there. Yeah, well, I'm especially with as many votes as yeah. it, which, and this is a pretty high number. Yeah, for us. But yeah, I'm surprised the movie didn't get like. A handful, at, at least. least a couple votes. Yeah. Especially, it was so funny. I went, not to sidetrack, it was just for like two seconds. I went and that I, I found the clip from the movie where he does the spinny on YouTube, the spinny laser gun mm -hmm. clip thing. And I scrolled through the comments and I, I was reminded that 
I should never look at YouTube comments, but every YouTube comment was just about how amazing and great the movie was. Oh just God. like the, how this movie was so amazing. I cried. Like, it's just like, this is the best scene in the whole movie. And I'm like, what is happening? What? Is, you know what? Good for you all. I'm glad you can enjoy this. I don't even know what. Okay. <laughs> it's just so, so interesting. All right. It's time now to learn a little bit about the author of our next novel, P.D. James. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. So this is not necessarily one that I would have uh, covered the author on. P.D. James isn't right, like I, a huge name. I had never name. heard of P.D. James. <laughs> um, I was going to, uh, originally I was going to do something a little more academic um, and talk about like children as symbols in like post-apocalyptic mm. dystopian mm -hmm. stories and then we had so much feedback for Ender's Game long, that I was yeah. like no 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 so short little section about P.D. James uh, so English writer P.D. James aka Phyllis Dorothy James it's a name and a half yep uh, aka Baroness of James Holland Park Baroness James of Holland Park Baroness Baroness James of Holland Park, yes. Baroness, huh? Yeah. Well, good for you. There's <laughs> more on that later. Uh, so the Children of Men, um, the movie dropped the article, the article at yep. the front, but the Children of Men is probably her best known title at this point, thanks to the movie. Yeah. Um, at least uh, outside of the UK, I can't speak for for like in over the, there, in, yeah, maybe, over yeah, there like, in, in the, the UK. UK maybe yeah. perhaps she's universally beloved. I yeah. don't know. Right. Um, but she is also known for her, um, Adam Dalgleish mystery series, her Cordelia Gray mystery series, a few other standalone novels, and for writing the Jane Austen fanfic novel, Death Comes to Pemberley. A Jane Austen fanfic, mm -hmm. huh? Interesting. Uh, so James was born in Oxford in 1920. She had to leave school at 16 to work and take care of her younger siblings for a couple reasons. Um, one, uh, because her family did not have much money. Two, because her father did not believe in higher education for girls. And also, her mother was institutionalized Oof. at the time. So they had a lot going on. Yeah, it was rough, rough um, But she made it through. She eventually got married and had two daughters. Um, but then her husband came back from the Second World War and was also <laughs> institutionalized. Um, so James studied hospital administration um, and eventually worked for a hospital board in London. So she went back and got her education so mm -hmm. she could get a better job. And she also began writing around this time, around the mid-1950s, um, and she used her maiden name to publish her books. Mm -hmm. Her first novel, Cover Her Face, was published in 1962, and it featured investigator Adam Dalgleish, a character that she would go on to feature in 14 more novels. Uh, the novel was well received by critics, although the author later described it as her least favorite among her books. So this is like a, uh, yeah, like a uh, like a, a mystery yeah. based around a specific like inspector. Yeah, like, like a, a serialized like kind of well, like what's, serialized. Uh, what's but, the um, Inspector Clouseau, like, yeah. kind of deal. Yeah, or a... Uh, um, isn't that his name in uh, 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 Murder on the Orient Express, isn't it? Inspector he, Clouseau. Isn't, isn't that Perot? Perot. Clouseau is... Is Clouseau <laughs> the Pink Panther? I think he might be. <laughs> he might be the Pink Panther. I think he might be. Um, yeah, like like Perot. Um, or or uh, uh, from uh, Knives Out, uh, which is going to... Well, that's what that's becoming now. Uh, Daniel Craig's character yeah. in Knives Out. Yeah. Or who were you going to say? Um, I was going to say um, it's a little less like this because these were written by ghostwriters and just like churned out. But like a like a Nancy Drew or the right. Hardy Boys yeah. where everything like each standalone novel yeah. is a mystery involving the same. Yeah, the yeah. same detective. Um, James's husband died in 1964 and following his death, uh, she quit her job at the hospital and worked as a civil servant instead, um, continuing to write and publish. Uh, during the 1980s, many of her mystery novels were adapted for television, um, for the ITV network ITV. in the UK. I think that's one of the lessers. Yeah. 
Well, actually, I don't know. I don't know the ranking. Obviously, it's not BBC's, one of the BBC's, but I know there's mm-hmm. also Sky TV and ITV, and I don't know what the order of, like, prestige there is <laughs> in terms of networks. And in the return of a uh, recently previously discussed topic, in 1991, James was created a life peer as Baroness James of Holland Park and sat in the House of Lords as a conservative. Interesting. Well, who knows what conservative means in England, but... Well, in 2014, um, she was also one of 200 public figures who were signatories to a letter in The Guardian opposing Scottish oh. independence. So, I, mm. I don't know the uh, the political intricacies of that. Yeah, I'll say but, I, don't, I um, couldn't even begin to understand the... But she opposed there Scottish independence, so... I think generally... As, as an American, yeah, I think that makes her the villain. Generally in favor of independence, and usually, I don't, again, without <laughs> knowing the intricacies at all of, of that, but, yeah. yeah. Um, and she died in her home in Oxford in 2014 at the ripe old age of 94. 94. So she lived for a hot minute. Interesting. 94. All right. Well, it's time now to learn a little bit more about her most popular novel, The Children of Men. I can't really remember when I last had any hope. And I certainly can't remember when anyone else did either. Because really, since women stopped being able to have babies, what's left to hope for? The world was stunned today by the death of Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet. The youngest person on Earth was 18 years, 4 months, 20 days, 16 hours and 8 minutes old. The ultimate mystery, why are women infertile? Some say it's genetic experiments, pollution. Why do you think we can't make babies anymore? Doesn't matter. It's all over in 50 years. It's too late. Move along! Hello, Theo. Have it The Children of Men is a 1992 dystopian novel by the previously discussed P.D. James. Uh, the title of The Children of Men comes from Psalm 90 in the Christian Bible. Quote, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnst man to destruction and sayest, return ye children of men. There you go. So there it is. I, and I, yeah, I'm interested to see, and we'll get to it a little bit in the, well, actually, I don't know how much we're going to do in the movie notes, but I am interested to see, because I know uh, it's not something I watched this movie for when I watched it the first couple times I, I was watching it more. It's just like a visual cinematic experience, but I am interested to see thematically what's going on, because in a little bit of research while I was doing for the prequel notes, it seems like faith, religion, mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff, and, and some there's a lot of allegory to certain things. Um, interested to see how that comes across in the film and... Yeah. How it vibes with me. We'll yeah. see. The narrative voice for The Children of Men alternates between the third person and the first person, uh, the latter in the form of a diary kept by one of the characters. Um, so we have a little bit of an epistolary setup. Interesting. I don't think that translates to the movie, but I could be wrong. It's been a long time. Uh, and the novel is set in England in the year of our Lord 2021. <laughs> Um, and it centers on the results of mass infertility. The book received positive reviews from many critics. Uh, for example, Karen James of the New York Times called it, quote, wonderfully rich and, quote, a trenchant analysis of politics and power that speaks urgently. Wow. That review is a oh, review. And then <laughs> That's I, a review. I had to include this quote because it might be one of my favorite reviews that I found doing research for this show. Uh, a review from Publishers Weekly noted, quote, readers should persevere through the slow start for the rewards of the story, including its reminder of the transforming power of hope, are many and lasting. There you go. So suffer through. Suffer through it. It'll be worth it. So, she, so says Catholic. Publisher Weekly. Um, <laughs> I, I don't I'm think so. No, I know. Uh, the novel was a commercial flop upon publication, 
James wrote in her 1999 autobiography, um, so that's seven years after this book was yeah. published, of, uh, quote, This is the only one of my novels which has not earned its advance, a depressing and somewhat demeaning thought. We'll get to it, but uh, so, this is something the movie shares with the, the book, <laughs> unfortunately. However, the novel found an enthusiastic audience within academic and theological circles, uh, unsurprisingly. Of the novel, academic Alan Jacobs said, quote, of all James' novels, The Children of Men is probably the most pointed in its social criticism, certainly the deepest in its theological reflection. Okay, I'm so interested. I, all of these reviews are driving me, which obviously they're just like one sentence snippets from reviews, but they're yeah. all so vacuous in content. Yes. <laughs> like, which again, it's a one sentence snippet from review. I understand, but I'm like, but what is it's saying <laughs> which I obviously we'll get to I just... uh, in in 2019 bbc news included the children of men on its list of the 100 most influential novels uh, and in addition to the film adaptation there's also an audiobook version of the novel um i currently have it i borrowed it from the library and <laughs> The first section of the book is that diary portion mm -hmm. and the, the voice that the audiobook reader is doing is amazing. So who is if, the character? Uh he's like it's a, he. It's, a, it's he? a he. It's like a rich guy. Oh, okay. Oh. I don't know who that would be. It's not Clive Owen's character, I don't think. Oh, it's might be Michael Caine's character is he doing Michael Caine does he sound I, like I don't Mike? know he does not sound like Michael Caine because I, I remember so few of the details from this movie but I'm fairly certain that Clive Owen's character is not rich but Michael he Caine's character doing might be. um I will I will just say that the it's a choice <laughs> interesting <laughs> the, the vocal work that he's doing it's it's a choice awesome all right time to learn a little bit more now about Children of Men the film I'm sorry about the theatrics. Police have been a pain lately. I haven't seen you for nearly 20 years. I need your help. Not for me, a girl. I need to get her to the coast, past security checkpoints. It's hard for me to look at you. He you had your eyes. So why did you come to me? I trust you. Show him. Now you know what's at stake. Children of Men is a 2006 film co-written and directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who wrote and directed Gravity, A2 Mama Tambien, Roma, and the best Harry Potter movie, among other things. He also, uh, the film was also co-written by Timothy Sexton, David Arada, Mark Fergus, and Hawk Otsby. That's a name. Yep. Uh, Mark Fergus and Hawk Otsby both worked on... Uh, the first Iron Man and a few other, hmm. the other two, Timothy Sexton and David Arata, didn't have a ton of credits. But uh, anyways, the film stars Clive Owen, Julianne Moore, Claire Hope Ashete, Michael Caine, Chiwudel Ejiofor, and Charlie Hunnam. I just mentioned Chiwudel Ejiofor last episode, and here he is showing up in this movie. <laughs> I had forgotten he was in this movie. As soon as I saw his name, I was like, oh, that's right. He is in this movie. The film has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, an 84% on Metacritic, and a 7.9 out of 10 on IMDb. It was nominated for three Oscars, including Best Adapted Screenplay, Cinematography, and Best Editing. Uh, it won none of those, but at the time it went up against Pan's Labyrinth and The Ooh. Departed in Ooh. those categories, so it yeah. got destroyed. <laughs> I believe Pan's Labyrinth won cinematography uh, and editing. Stiff competition. Or no, yeah, Pan's Labyrinth runs one cinematography, and then The Departed won editing and best adapted screenplay. So the movie made seventy point five million dollars against a budget of seventy six million dollars. So despite critical success, it was a box office failure, similar to the book, hmm, where yeah. critics and other people, film scholars. Again, I watched this in film classes. All you know, really into this movie, yeah, but yeah, like the, the academics yeah, really liked I mean. the yeah, book. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it your, was a your average audiences were like, mm, although yeah. I think people who saw the movie liked it, it just yeah. for whatever reason didn't make money, uh, which there can be a lot of reasons why that happens. And even if audiences like a movie, mm -hmm. you can still not make money. So the book was first optioned in 1997, was that five years after it was written? 
uh, with Mark Fergus and Hawk Otsby rewriting an early draft of a script. Quaron was then brought on in 2001 with Timothy Sexton to rewrite that script again. Quaron was apparently afraid of second guessing things, as he said, so he actually did not read the book as he was working on the screenplay, but instead had Timothy Sexton read the script or read the book while Quaron read an abridged version of the script to, to huh. use for his input. So they're kind of doing a version of our show there. He didn't want to be like too, yeah. you know, he wanted to bring his own stuff to it. I guess without being completely influenced by the hmm. by the book, but also wanted his writing partner to have read the book, so they kind of like yeah, worked at it together. It's an interesting way to do it. Then uh, Quaron went on to do the movie was kind of delayed because Quaron was doing uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, and while he was doing that, David Arata rewrote the screenplay again, <laughs> and then this draft that was written helped uh, was what actually ended up helping secure Clive Owen for the lead role. He read that version of the script and then signed on hmm. to be the lead in the movie. The movie was filmed uh, primarily in London and actually is really interesting. During the time they were filming the London bombings in 2005, I think it was 2005 or four, something like that, happened during their filming, but they ended up not moving uh, the production because Quran said, quote, it would have been impossible to shoot anywhere but London because of the very obvious way the locations are incorporated into the film. And actually, they shot, there's a terrorist attack in the opening of the movie that they shot like two weeks after the London bombing. Oh, so it was, God. <laughs> yeah, S something. It was something. So uh, this film may be most known by people sort of in passing for its very uh, famous, iconic single shot sequences, of which there are a few, but there are three major ones. There's the scene where Key gives birth, which is three minutes and 19 seconds long. There's uh, an ambush scene on a country road, which is four minutes and seven seconds long. And there's a scene where Theo is captured by the fishes, escapes, and then runs down a street through a building in the middle of a giant battle. And that scene is six minutes and 18 seconds, all of those are one continuous shot or at least appear to be they're not hmm. none of them are actually one continuous shot but they look like they are it took 14 days to prepare for the single shot in which clive owen's character uh searches a building during the battle and every time they wanted to reset that shoot that shot to do it again it took five hours to reset oh, all of the no. actors <laughs> all of the like because there's like pro you know there's like explosions going off and stuff five hours to re uh to reset that oh i don't have the patience for that <laughs> during that scene in one of the shots and this is the thing that i you, you'll see it in the movie and there's a cut where it goes away but during that shot at one point uh an explosion a squib something goes off and blood actually gets on the camera it splatters onto the lens of the camera. Uh, and cinematographer Emmanuel Lubezki, uh, who also shot Gravity, Birdman, and The Revenant, among other things, an incredible cinematographer, uh, convinced Quaron to leave it in because he thought it added to the real, like, the grittiness. Nah, of... he just didn't want to reset. <laughs> Five hours, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I want to go home. And from my memory, there's a moment where I, it's either, I think there's like, a, it's one of the moments where there's a digital edit, mm -hmm. like, where there's a hidden edit, it kind of, like... Like hide disappear. It. Well, it just kind of disappears as you're watching, uh -huh. but you don't realize it disappears because it's kind of hidden in one of the hidden edits already, uh, from my memory. But it is on the on. I do remember being on this on the camera for a while. So, uh, uh, speaking now of the, uh, the the country road ambush scene, originally that was going to make use of extensive CGI environments, but Lubezki argued against that. The cinematographer and said, no, we don't want to do it CG, we want to do this practically. So they actually invented a brand new special camera rig by a guy uh, named Gary, ooh, Teal, Tealges? Teal, Tilches. <laughs> Tilches. Teal, I don't know, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, T-H-I-E-L-T-G-E-S, good, good luck with that one. But he invented this special camera rig, and this is a, this, this scene is seared into my brain because it's so freaking cool. Uh, it's basically a camera rig that that allows the camera to spin in a full 360, mm -hmm. like operated remotely. Um, and then so they <laughs> they modified a vehicle to enable the seats to be able to tilt and lower actors out of the way of the camera. Um, and then the windshield was designed to tilt out of the way so the camera could move in and out of the front windscreen. And a crew of four people, including the director of photography and the camera operator, rode on the roof of the car during the scene. This scene is incredible. It's the most one of the most mind-blowing. And this movie has like quite a few mind-blowing scenes. This scene is 
something else. It's wild. Uh, again, from my memory of watching it 10 years ago or whatever. Uh, so I have to share this quote because I absolutely love how pretentious this is. This is I believe this is from IMDb Trivia. <laughs> <laughs> Writer and director Alfonso Cuaron stated that he, quote, didn't want to make a film that ends when the credits roll. He wanted to make a film that when the final credits roll, that's really the beginning of the film. <laughs> quote. <laughs> that's my it's so pretentious. To be fair, Cuaron can be pretentious. He's earned it, <laughs> but it's hilarious. I love that. Oh, God. Uh, so Clive Owen's character, Theo, uh, apparently, and I this blows my mind, again, from my memory of this movie, does not use or even touch a gun at any point in the film, hmm. which is wild with what goes on in this movie. <laughs> But I, 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 thinking on it, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't remember him using a gun, but it, if you would have asked me, I would have been like, oh, yeah, he's shooting people all over the place. But I don't think he is. Uh, apparently not. Uh, so getting to some reviews here before we wrap up, as we always do, Dana Stevens of Slate called the film, quote, the herald of another blessed event, the arrival of a great director by the name of Alfonso Cuaron. Uh, Stevens hailed the film, uh, the film's extended car chase and the battle scenes as, quote, two of the most virtuoso single shot, shouldn't be virtuosic, anyways, two of the <laughs> most virtuoso single shot chase sequences I've ever seen, end quote, which I would have to agree with. Uh, Manola Dargis of the New York Times called the film, quote, a superbly directed political thriller, uh, giving a bunch of accolades again to the long chase scenes in the film. Ethan Alter of Film Journal International said, quote, easily one of the best films of the year with scenes that, quote, dazzle you with their technical complexity and visual virtuosity. Virtuosity just all over the Apparently. reviews for this. I truly cannot stress enough how this move, how much elements of this movie blew my mind the first time I saw it. It's wild. It's truly wild. Um, it may not for people like because we've seen stuff like similar to this in stuff since this movie. And uh -huh. and there are movies and Quanron talked about it in stuff that I read. I just didn't put a lot of it in here. He pulled some of this from like I think like French New Wave. There's certain movements of cinema where they did some really cool like long shot things in ways that are just yeah wildly impressive where they're putting cameras on pulley systems and like running them up under. I, I've seen this one. I think it was a French film. I haven't seen the movie, but I've, I've seen this one shot from like the 40s or something or I don't even know from forever ago where this camera is like go, following a parade down this street and then it goes up the side of a building and then over the street and then <laughs> in through a window and then down through this building inside the building and then out another window over a like and it, it's like, how did they do this in, you yeah. know, like 80 years ago? I don't know. It's wild. But um. That kind of thing is what inspired Quaron to do that in this film. Um, also, they wanted the film to really look like, kind of feel like a documentary. Mm. Like, they wanted a really, like, documentary-style feel to it. Uh, so, yeah, I like I said, I would agree. Uh, Jonathan Rooney, uh, no, Jonathan Romney of The Independent praised the film uh, for its accurate portrayal of the United Kingdom, apparently, mm. <laughs> which is bombed out and war-torn in this yeah, movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> but he criticized some of the film's futuristic scenes as, quote, run-of-the-mill future fantasy okay all right uh which i believe you said the book takes place in 2021 yeah i think the movie takes place in 2027 so I not a big difference right. but yeah something pretty close uh so peter travers of rolling stone ranked it his number two film on the best films of the decade writing quote I thought director Alfonso Cuaron's film of P.D. James' futuristic political fable novel was good when it opened in 2006. After repeated viewings, I know Children of Men is indisputably great. No movie this decade was more redolent of sorrowful beauty and exhilarating action. You don't just watch the car ambush scene, pure camera wizardry, you live inside it. That's Cuaron's magic, he makes you believe. And finally, as always, if we have it, a Roger Ebert review for the Chicago Sun-Times. He gave the film four out of four stars, writing, quote, Quaron fulfills the promise of futuristic fiction. Characters do not wear strange costumes or visit the moon, and the cities are not plastic hallucinations, but look just like today, except tired and shabby. Here is certainly a world ending not with a bang but a whimper, and the film serves as a cautionary warning. End quote. So... Is Roger Ebert pulling a uh, futuristic fiction from like 
the 60s here because yeah i i know i don't I don't Futuristic know. fiction has not looked like that for even, a even long time. Even when I time. agree with Roger Ebert, I find myself <laughs> disagreeing with him, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, uh, before we get to uh, where you can watch this, we want to remind you, you can do us a giant favor by heading over to patreon.com slash this film is lit. Support us there. As we mentioned at the top, uh, if you support us at the $15 level, you get added to that list where we give you a shout out every episode. You can change your name and make us say whatever you want. Uh, also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Goodreads, all the social media. Just search for This Film is Lit, uh, and that's where we get all your feedback that we talked about earlier in this episode. Uh, and this episode coming up, Children of Men, was in fact a patron request from one of our $15 Academy Award winning patrons. So if you go support us there, you can request something too. Katie, who was it? Uh, this was a request from V. Frank. V. Frank, thank you for giving me an excuse to watch Children of Men again. <laughs> Katie, where can people watch Children of Men? Well, as always, you can check with your local library or a local video rental store if you happen to have one of those still. Yep. Uh, if not, you can rent this for around 3 to $4 from Apple TV, Amazon Prime, YouTube, Vudu, AMC Theaters On Demand, Redbox, DirecTV, or Google Play. So it's not actually, like, included streaming anywhere, apparently. I don't think so, no. Unfortunate. But it's worth the rental. I'll, I'll just say that much. I would highly recommend, uh, if you have not seen Children of Men before, definitely go give it a rent and check it out. Because I'm very excited to rewatch this for the first time in a decade. Probably also find this one at the library. Yeah, I actually, yeah, think. very likely at the library. So, yeah, go do that first. Find it at the library. But if you can't, rent it because... Uh, it's it's you'll enjoy it. It'll be, it's a good it's a good movie. Right. I, I would say that I hope it's not being oversold, but I, I don't feel like it's being oversold. And I'm I'm already, I'm already kind of finding the book a little boring. So the movie is not boring. <laughs> I will say that the movie is not boring. Um, I, I I am interested to see. I don't think it's being oversold in the sense again of it's just like a, a visual feast, a masterpiece mm -hmm. of like film craft. I am interested to see thematically, narratively, yeah. how I vibe with it now, because uh, I'm a very different person than I was in 2008 or whatever when I watched this, or 2009 or something. Very different person. Um, and then on top of that, uh, I just yeah, I just I I watch things differently. I you know yeah, I digest things very differently than I did at the time. Whereas then I was just like, man, this is look at the camp, look at this shot. Oh, this is so cool. And which I still do that, but I also am like thinking about what's going on. So. Yeah. And I, I'm also in, interested to see how it compares to the book because I'm already getting um, many signals that it might be quite different. Interesting. I could be wrong, but I, I'm already getting that vibe. Well, it was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, so they had to change something. <laughs> <laughs> Else they'd be like, yeah, it's not even, he just did it again. Uh, yes. Uh, so in one week's time, we're talking about Children of Men. And until that time... Guys, gals, non-binary pals, everybody else. Keep reading books. Keep watching movies. And keep being awesome.